Well, coming up on today's show, a motorbike theme takes over. The Tesla Model 3 performance track mode hits and ChargePoint moves from the USA to Europe with grand ambitions. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Wherever you are in the world, welcome to EV News Daily. Welcome to the weekend, Saturday, 10th of November, 2018. It's Martin Lee here, and I've been through every EV story I had time to find today to save you time. So you haven't got to flick through loads of different places to find all the biggest stories that you need to to know about in the future of sustainable transport. Thank you so much to the team at myev.com for helping make this show where they've built the world's first marketplace all about buying and selling used EVs. They've made it simple, they've added loads of features that you need as an EV buyer or seller and a bunch of articles to help you learn and research about EVs like today. I saw they've added one about the state of the tax incentives in the USA. Of course, it's a North American website, so uh, it's uh, perfectly relevant to the readers. Uh, Maybe not so much over here in the UK or Europe, but what is the current state of the different EV makers and how much discount you're going to get going forward? A great article to have a little read about, uh, by the way. We'll start with a bit of a motorbike uh, double story today. First of all, Perhaps the biggest name, not in electric motorcycles, you could argue the biggest name in electric bikes is Zero Motorcycles. But one of the most famous names on two wheels, full stop, is Harley Davidson. And when they start getting in on the act, you know that EVs are here to stay. Well, Harley Davidson's latest motorcycle isn't your typical hog. In fact, it could be considered the antithesis. Earlier this week... The Wisconsin-based motorcycle maker unveiled the production version of the Livewire, a fully electric powertrain. According to Motor Authority, Harley-Davidson didn't provide production performance specs at the reveal of the bike, but power comes from a permanent magnet electric motor settled into the lower party uh, part of the body. That placement of the motor, just like the batteries on an EV car being down low, gives it a very low centre of gravity to improve handling and help control the bike under hard braking. Without the legendary Harley-Davidson sound, though, what do you do? Well, they've developed a tone which increases in pitch and volume with speed. That tone is meant to represent the smooth power that's coming from the electric drive train. And the Jaguar I-Pace has done something similar recently. In the YouTube videos I've seen, people just end up turning it off, really, because it's not why you buy an EV to mimic a fossil. The little Renault Zoe that we've got is a weird noise. It's like a... And you're like, no, just no, just turn it off. I'm sure it does turn itself off after... 20 miles an hour or something when you can you couldn't hear it for the tire noise anyway but when you're cruising around town i'm like you know i'm not going to run over any blind people don't worry just turn it off when it comes to charging the harley davidson the live wire will plug into a standard outlet for level one level two level three dc fast charging yep all catered for it's a lithium-ion battery and a smaller 12 volt battery as you'd find in most evs anyway all evs actually have a 12 volt battery to power things like the lights the horn and the control electronics and the second little two-wheeled story that i wanted to bring you today is the electric motorcycle startup called arc 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 they want to do what they want to do on two wheels what tesla's done for four wheels And they're going to do it with a premium bike, an individual bike, they say, an all-electric super bike that's going to be very fast and in tune with its rider. And according to Slash Gear, the Samsung-made batteries are organized into the different modular cells, with Arc suggesting there's enough of them to get 200 miles of urban riding or 120 miles of highway riding from the pack. Now, the pack is 16.8 kilowatt hours. To put that into perspective, well, a Nissan Leaf could be 20, 30, or 40 odd kilowatt hours, and the average size of home battery storage about 5 to 10, sort of 5 to 15 kilowatt hour uh, pack size for home storage. So it's good. I mean, for a motorbike, for a lightweight bike. 17 kilowatt hours as, as the pack is, is really good. It's going to recharge in 45 minutes on a fast charger, 0 to 60, 3.1 seconds. Top speed, 120. 
I'll put a link to that article in the show notes. And talking of top speed, talking of really having fun on a track, well, Tesla have enabled track mode for the Model 3. Now, Kim Reynolds from Motor Trend got an insight into how you take the standard Model 3 and then how you build track mode. Track mode has got some videos online that the official Tesla Twitter account posted from a drone, actually. And not only is the drone pilot brilliant because they're catching, they're, they're keeping up with the Tesla Model 3, but also the driver, incredible skills, looks like a rear wheel drive, German sports car, like a, you know, like a fast BMW hanging the rear end out, smoking the tires, looks like the kind of thing you would do in a rear wheel drive fossil car in a four wheel drive electric car. Well, Kim Reynolds for Motor Trend says that the resident racer Randy Pobst and I, were sitting on two bar stools in the cinder block building next to Willow Springs Street Circuit. And he leaned in and said, it was fascinating to have an engineer sitting next to me, hanging on for dear life, holding a laptop and actually typing into it while I'm driving at speed. Changing its code? Yes. And I could feel it in the car, says Randy. He uh, cockeyed, smiles, uh, smiled uh, with a sort of amused, what the heck is going on on his face? So this is a story all about Tesla hiring uh, professional driver Randy Pops, who's done perhaps more miles than most in terms of track driving a car, but in able to hit the track, do a ton of laps, and then when they change the slightest thing, a little bit of balance here and there, maybe something on the diff, or maybe some dampers. And he can feel it, right? He can feel it through the seat of his pants, and he can feel those little minor changes. So he was doing a day of driving for Tesla with the engineers in the passenger seat as they had their laptops open, and he's banging around the circuit. They used three different Model 3s for this to ensure that the batteries were always in the best condition, that they were always charged up, and that the latest code could have been applied to the cars, not to lose any track time. So they hired him, they hired the track for the day to develop track mode. Here's the coolest thing, says... Motor Trend today. Less than a week after the test session, Randy's tuning expertise is available to all. Uh, today, Tesla has released the release version software for track mode to owners of the Model 3 performance cars. Those are the ones which are capable of having track mode. And the combined wizardry of software engineers from the Fremont factory for Tesla and Randy being uh, kind of beamed over the air with your overnight updates that happen. If you have a Tesla, of course, you well know that you wake up in the morning and your car just got 3% better one day. All you have to do now is find a track, find somewhere safe, hopefully that you have enough skill and push a button and enjoy the fruits of all that hard work. And I thought I'd put that story in today because that is not only the way of the future, the way that our cars are going to be going forward, but it sums up exactly what I always say about Tesla. They're a software company who happen to make cars, and they're an energy company who happen to make cars. The cars, although they are a car company, I, they're, they're a Silicon Valley software company first. And so when they need to develop a new mode, just as when they needed the brakes to be better, when Consumer Reports tested the Model 3 and said it's all great, but we think the brakes aren't great, they went back with the software and millions of lines of code and shortened the distance. They made the car safer. They made the brakes better over the air. You get up one morning, the car's done an update, and all of a sudden, it's better. They're a software company first. They're an energy company first. People walking around going, I can't believe that Tesla's, you know, it's now worth more than BMW as of yesterday in terms of the, the market capitalization of the company. It's because you're comparing apples and oranges. You can't compare a car company in BMW with what, whatever Tesla ends up being. And all these car companies like BMW and Volkswagen, and Mercedes, all want to be mobility companies in the future. They all want to own the way that you get from A to B. And maybe that'll be in ride sharing on electric scooters, electric bikes in their cars. They know they can't just carry on making trucks, you know, because if that's, if that's all Ford are going to do, if all Ford are going to do is make F-150 trucks between now and bankruptcy, well, that's all they're going to do. They have to, they have to get in on, on the, in the game somehow. And talking about Tesla... Some people weren't entirely happy with how to get in to their Model 3. 
over 100,000 people, by the way, getting into Model 3s now. And some people didn't like using the mobile phone. Some people didn't like the little credit card that you got with it as an emergency backup that you held against the side B pillar of the car. You no longer need to rely on that key card as your smartphone and the key fob all grant you access. So you can now buy a little black as any Tesla fan will know, but I'll explain it for everybody else. It's a small little key fob, and it's in the it's it's in the shape of the car. So it fits in the palm of your hand, and it looks like a perfectly scaled down version of your Model Three that sits outside your house, uh, except it's your key fob to the car. It's you press once to lock it, you press twice to unlock it. You press twice on the front or rear trunk to open it, and you do a long press to open the charging port. Well, Eric Loveday at Inside EVs adds that Tesla had initially told the website that the key fob is going to be free for existing owners upon request, but provided to new owners with the purchase of a new Model 3 at uh, uh, of the car. Uh, there's 100,000 Model 3 sold now, though, so that's an expensive operation to do to start giving them away for free, though. Uh, the FOB is currently listed on Tesla's website for $150. And also, remember, this key FOB doesn't feature passive entry, so this doesn't work. You know, it's Bluetooth, but it doesn't work in a way that the other keys do. So you just walk up to your car and open the door without pressing any single button. So it's not a passive entry device. But for those people that want something more physical than having your mobile phone in your pocket, and, and for all the reviews that I read, and I'm not a Model 3 owner, but all the reviews I read so that it works probably better on iPhones than Android. But for everybody with an iPhone for iOS, they say it's faultless. And for most people with Android phones, it's fine. There's just I think it's a couple of glitches in the system there where it doesn't always work first time round. But if you've got, if otherwise you're a Tesla owner, Model 3 owner, you've got your mobile phone in your pocket. And generally, if you're heading out of the house and getting into your car to go somewhere, you've nearly always got your phone on you anyway. And so particularly if you are forward leaning in terms of technology, then, and you're buying a car like a Tesla, you're probably going to have a smartphone that's always on and you just walk up to your car and it's done. And you open the door and off you go. But for those that don't want that, you can now buy yourself a physical key fob. Two more stories to go on the podcast today. VW is planning a $21,000 entry-level subcompact EV crossover. Wow, there's a description. Let's work that one out. $21,000. Yep, that's pretty straightforward. Subcompact, so think smaller than a Golf. Uh, The EV, obviously electric, and crossover. So it's going to be... That kind of crossover style, a little, little taller than a, a, a sedan. People like that mini SUV styling. Well, this is new to me, and I haven't reported on it, even though this story is a couple of days old, because I've been just trying to dig through where the story started. Who reported it first? Because, look, I first saw this story on the Electric website, and they very quickly had to publish not a retraction, but a clarification, because their story was that a $21,000 VW electric car is coming ergo that's going to be the price of the Neo ergo the Neo must be much smaller than we think now the Neo is the Golf that's not a Golf don't call it a Golf it looks a lot like a Golf and is the same size as a Golf but don't call it a Golf because there's an e-Golf out there already no 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 this is the VW Neo their very first car in the ID range and so electric was sort of putting two and two and two and two together and being like well hang on if they're going to launch a subcompact car that means we've got our description of the id neo wrong then they had to kind of come back a couple of hours later and go oh no 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 no! this is a different this twenty one thousand car dollar car is a different car to the one that we've been talking about with the id neo so for that clarification i was clear but volkswagen somewhere along the line this week have said to somebody they're launching an eighteen thousand euro that's a twenty one thousand dollar all electric subcon packed car that is more affordable for many people this is a bloom i traced it back to a bloomberg report and the bloomberg report says it's according to people familiar with the matter which is never good you want to get an exact source 
But we'll go with it. The entry-level vehicle may be built at VW's factory in Emden, said the people who asked not to be identified because the plan hasn't actually been approved yet by the supervisory board. Sales could start sometime after 2020, and they expect to sell 200,000 of them a year. So there's lots of coulds and coulds and might-dos and maybes in that story, which is why I haven't A, reported it earlier in the week and B, put it further up the, the order of stories today. So... What is clear is the ID range is coming. You've got the ID Buzz, the ID Cross with all the Zs, Zzz, and then you've got the the Neo, which still, by the way, is not officially the Neo. It's just the thing, the name, the, the working title that we're all calling it, which is the replacement to the Golf. That's coming. Expect it to be low thirty thousand something dollars. It's going to be the same price as a Golf. It's going to be up against Tesla Model Three. Uh, this new car which hasn't been confirmed is something very different so don't get those two things confirmed it's good that we're talking about it but vw we want to be talking about cars that you're actually making come on we want to get in uh, in one of those vw electric cars Finally, ChargePoint, one of the world's largest charging station grids for electric vehicles, expects them as to split a major expansion plan equally between the US and Europe, according to its chief executive. And a Reuters report said the company said back in September it was aiming for 2.5 million charging points globally by 2025. The CEO, Pascal Romano, said to Reuters at the Web Summit conference in Lisbon that the increase was actually going to be split pretty much equally between the US and Europe. And this is because Europe is increasingly seen as a place where electric vehicles are going to evolve more quickly than the US. Partly down to President Trump pulling out of the Paris Climate Agreement. ChargePoint doesn't own any of the recharging stations that it, it makes, but it functions like, like Airbnb or Uber. They create a network of locations and schedule bookings available at any of those charging points. And so it'll be interesting to see how they expand out of their home market of the US and here in Europe, where I agree lots of things are being done. We've got regulation coming in 2020, which is really going to hit the anyone who wants to sell cars in terms of emissions. And so it's going to be happening very quickly here. I kind of forget that California is mostly a bubble and you realize how many cars are being sold evs in california that doesn't mean there are parts of the u.s where you can spend all day and and not see an electric car drive past so that's kind of interesting uh, it, look it's the same here I, in the last month i've been to norway which was incredible and sweden i mean S stockholm's a beautiful place but far fewer evs in sweden even though it's a lot of million, million miles away from Norway. And yet when I went to Norway and we spent a week there and those communities are just, they're just electric cars everywhere of all shapes and sizes and types. So even here in Europe, there's so many differences. It'll be interesting to see how the market moves forward with a big charge point uh, name there being involved. Thank you very much to myev.com for setting this week's question of the week. And it's your chance to get your answers in before Sunday's show. What's the ideal way for you to be driving an electric car? Is it to buy a brand new one? Is it to lease a new one? Is it to buy a used one? Maybe it's a car sharing scheme. If you live in a city, maybe you've got no ambitions to ever own a car. I know plenty of certainly 20-something people whose ambition is never to own a car because if you live in a big city and there's car sharing schemes, there's Uber, why would they need to? So what's the best way for you to sit behind the wheel of an electric car? Let me know. You can email hello at evnewsdaily.com. If you want to use the comments on YouTube or Facebook, I'd love you to do that, or even the feedback form. I think it says like email or contact me on my own website, which is evnewsdaily.com. Thank you to the 115 patrons of the podcast who all support this show on patreon.com slash evnewsdaily, those who support at executive producer level and above. You get your bonus show this weekend as well with even more news. And uh, we go a little bit deeper. It's a bit more of a deep dive into EVs for those that support at those levels or more. There are 291 previous episodes of the show online for free. Get them from wherever you get your podcasts from. If you subscribe as well, well, this is interesting. If you subscribe... You get them first, and you get every podcast free. And the best thing is you get them automatically, because nobody wants to be opening up an app and downloading things. And 
If you subscribe, it's a weight off your mind. If you can leave a little review, always very, very welcome. Have a wonderful weekend. If you're checking out socials like Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter, you can find me on all of those. Question of the week will be answered on Sunday's show, so you have a few more hours to get yours in. I'm looking forward to receiving your email. In the meantime, do have a wonderful day, and I'll catch you tomorrow.